Unlike in most countries, women started off with the right to vote in Canada. Early voter rights in Canada only allowed for landowners to vote. Early female landowners would vote under the principle that if they paid taxes, they would get to vote. No taxation without representation. This was stopped in 1800 Quebec, then known as Upper Canada, when a law sternly stated that they only male landowners would get to vote. While the suffrage movements around the world were marked with violence and protest, the movement in Canada was civil and used humor as a weapon. The earliest supporters of women's suffrage in Canada was the Christian temperance movement that called for the alcohol prohibition across the country. Many argued that without women's votes, there would never be an end to alcohol consumption in the country. Thankfully, they were never able to achieve their goal. The movement was quite racist towards Chinese and worried about the drugs that the Chinese were using and giving to white men. A list of drugs being used by the Chinese included opium and marijuana, and they were placed on a ban list that remained unedited for almost a century. The main push for the suffrage came from the western prairies, where farm culture allowed for women to have run the business and gain education. An early protest in Ottawa saw six women perform a mock play in which they took sides like parliamentarians. They would become obsessed with politics. Politics are like drinks. Once you start, and then start a The bit of comedy caught the imaginations of Canadians. Among the young actresses was Nellie McClung, who would become the leader of a group named the Famous Five. McClung would also rise to become an elected member of the Alberta legislature. Women's suffrage spread across Canada starting in 1916. First, Manitoba allowed women to vote in their provincial legislation then Saskatchewan, then Alberta, then British Columbia, and finally Ontario. Suffrage in the rest of Canada would take more doing though. After all, there was a war going on, and it was taking its toll on the country's supply of able-bodied voting men. If female suffrage was approved, it would mean that women, rather than men, would be deciding the fate of the country. And that was also the moment that sparked the right to vote for women across Canada. With Canada's male volunteers fighting in Europe, there was a need to pass conscription and a need to get more men to fight and die on the front lines. But Canada's bravest men were off fighting and thus not able to vote. What remained in Canada were refugees, immigrants, and men presumed too cowardly to fight. In terms of a voting bloc, it was one that would never vote for conscription. In 1917, all women who served in the military, or were related to someone who served in the military, were given the right to vote. At the same time, any citizens naturalized after 1902 were stripped of their right to vote. Conscription, of course, passed. This was not just a victory for women who wanted to vote, but also for men. It was the first time that voter rights were extended to non-land-owning males. After the war ended, all women across Canada were given the right to vote, considered a reward for their great service to the country in its time of need. Women during the war took on many of the duties that typically men had kept, the industries, farms, and service of the countries working while men were gone. All the provinces gave voting rights to women after this. The Maritimes gave them in roughly the same year, although New Brunswick wouldn't allow women to run for government until 1940. In that same year, Quebec, being the laggard and the last one, would allow women to vote. The final issue that arose was as to whether or not women could be appointed to the Senate. The Senate required an appointee to be first and above all else, a person, and women were blocked from joining the lower house entirely on this basis. To the rescue were the famous five, Emily Murphy, Irene Parleby, Nellie McClung, Louise McKinley, and Henrietta Weir Edwards. People were mixed on their opinions of these women. They were white supremacists who were actively campaigning for institutional eugenics across Canada. In terms of immigration, they believed that only white people should be permitted to immigrate to Canada. Emily Murphy would often lecture on not allowing people with bad genes to procreate. Nellie McClung, while in Alberta legislature, campaigned to sterilize the handicapped, but also wanted to sterilize Aboriginals and the Chinese. So although they were fighting the good fight, they were also not too popular with Canada's left-leaning groups. In 1916, Emily Murphy walked into a courtroom to hear a case. She was kicked out as the subject matter was not fit for a woman. The five serviced a petition that would force the courts to answer the question, are women legally considered a person? Henrietta Everts, on behalf of Emily Murphy, took the issue to court. A judge ruled that in Alberta, that if a woman cannot be present in a courtroom because it is not fit for a woman, then there must be a women's court with women judges. 
By this notion, women must be persons because they must then be permitted to be judges. The challenge then went to Canada, where Emily Murphy submitted her name to become a Canadian senator. She was rejected on the basis that she was not a person. After it went to the Supreme Court, a ruling in what is known as the Persons Case ruled that women are in fact people. Women could now become senators. In 1989, Canada had its first female prime minister. But that's a story for another time. <laughs>